Good morning. Ooh, hot mic. Is that better? You guys can still hear me? All right. Ooh. How are you all doing? Good? Yes. Welcome back. Uh, glad to have you with us. Um, apologize for not being here last week, but uh, we were in Nashville. It was good. Uh, I was telling some other people, it's like drinking from a fire hose. They just turn the hose on, things come at you 5,000 miles an hour, you pick up what you can and keep taking notes as fast as you can and hopefully you work your way through it. So, um, yeah, it was good. Lots on leadership, lots on um, navigating change in congregations and different stuff, all sorts of good stuff. But uh, it's good to be back here. It's good to be back home and uh, be with you all here this morning. We are finishing up Mark chapter 4, and then we're going to move into chapter 5. Uh, but before we do, let's pray, and then we'll do a little review. We'll see what we remember from all that long ago, and, uh, and then we'll cover the last section, uh, Jesus and the storm, in chapter 4, and then we'll move into chapter 5. So let's pray. Uh, Lord God, Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for this day and for your many blessings each and every day. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to gather around your word, and we just ask that you would open our hearts and minds as we dive into it, uh, that you would help us to learn and grow and understand uh, uh, what you have to tell us, what you share with us in the good news of who Jesus is for us and what he has done for us. Uh, continue to uh, grow that faith that you have placed in us and help it to uh, flourish. All this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So the gospel of Mark, what do we remember? What are some of the important things that we've taken away thus far from Mark? It's been two weeks, <laughs> feels like forever. Yes. Mark is direct to the point, not long-winded. He doesn't elaborate on things, okay? What else? Okay, so we covered uh, Jesus' teaching on the parable of the sower. Good. Hey, spread the word, right? It's a big point. Good. What else do we remember? Jesus is a man of action. He's always on the move. He's always doing something, right? We don't get a whole lot of stories about Jesus just sitting and eating, or we don't, we don't get a lot of fluff, right? Jesus is, there again, he's moving from place to place because Mark's favorite word is? Immediately, good. Um, who's the author? We said, well, it's Mark. Who's he getting a report from, most likely? Peter, who's in Rome. Okay, he's helping him write uh, the gospel. Okay, uh, what else do we know? Okay, we've got some explanation of parables that are unique to Mark. Uh, Jesus actually gives us the meaning Okay. Sometimes referred to as John. Sometimes referred to as John. Okay, sometimes referred to as John or John Mark. Good. Yeah, Jesus is irritating the Pharisees. Um, he tends to be uh, breaking the law, right? Um, and I think we heard this in a video, one of the videos, right? Um, what were they, uh, the, Fer the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders, Israel was waiting for the Messiah. And what did they say 
needed to happen in order to, for the Messiah to come? That they had to keep what? You remember this? Uh, yeah, two Sabbaths in a row, right? If all of Israel would just, if they would keep the Sabbath two weeks in a row, God would be so pleased with Israel, he would send the Messiah. And Jesus comes along, and what does he do on the Sabbath? He heals. He, he works. He teaches. He allows his disciples to pick heads of grain, right? We have all these different things, and so, you know, here they are. Hey, Israel's got to keep the Sabbath, and then Messiah will come, and the Messiah is standing in front of them, and he's breaking the Sabbath, right? Um, good. What else do we see? Or what else do we remember? Yeah, he records the fewest teaching chunks of, de of Jesus, and yet he refers to him as teacher more than any other gospel. Jesus is constantly doing battle with what? Yeah, Satan, evil spirits. We'll see that again here in Mark chapter 5. Okay? Anything else? Um, one other point. Um, I think this is a big one because it gets to the heart of, of who Jesus really is in the Gospel of Mark. We've already kind of mentioned it, but what is Jesus really concerned with in the Gospel of Mark? We've said he's not concerned with the law. He's concerned with people, right? Um, caring for people, loving on people, healing people, um, bringing grace and mercy into the world, right? That's his focus rather than the law, and that's what puts him in tension there again with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, okay? All right, so let's, let's jump in to Mark chapter four, and we're gonna finish up. Uh, we covered the teachings earlier, the parable of the sower, uh, the lamp under the basket, the seed growing, the mustard seed, and Pastor Kyle forgot Jesus calms the storm. Um, so let's dive in there. Mark chapter four, verse 35. Okay. On that day, when evening had come, now remember, we're still on a Sabbath, and we found that out uh, from uh, the beginning of chapter four. Jesus is teaching on a Sabbath. So here's, we're later in the day, um, after all this preaching, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with them uh, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? All right, I want to pause there. So remind me, who are the disciples? What was their occup or what was many of their occupations before following Jesus? Yeah, they were fishermen, right? Uh, they were experienced in boats. They were experienced of being out on the sea, okay? And so they're out there, and all of a sudden this windstorm kicks up. Now notice it says, and there were other boats with him. So they don't go out there by themselves. There's a whole group of boats that that fill up, and they're going to go with Jesus to the other side. Uh, eventually, the storm arises, and they probably turn back, okay? But they keep plowing on because Jesus wants to get to the other side. Um, and where's Jesus? Yeah, this is one of the few places where we get Jesus kind of in his humanity. Um, one of the few places where Jesus talks about, uh, or excuse me, where Mark talks about Jesus like sleeping or eating or, right, he's asleep on the cushion. Um, he's doing the thing that, that people do when they're tired, right? Um, and so the boat's filling with water, okay? If they're experienced fishermen and your boat's filling with water, what do you do? You bail it out, right? 
Uh, apparently, it's coming in faster than what they can bail it out. So they realize, uh-oh, we've, we've got a big problem here, right? This isn't gonna go well if we keep chugging along and this storm keeps breaking into the boat. We're gonna have an issue. And so they go and they, the Jesus is asleep and they wake him and they say, what? Teacher, don't you care? Now that's interesting because what has Jesus shown throughout the entire gospel? That he cares. They've been with him. They've seen him caring for people, but now they're in the midst of it, and what is their response? You, don't you care about us, right? You care about everybody else. You care about the guy with the, paral you know, with the hand that's withered. You care about the paralytic. Jesus, we're going to die out here. Do something, right? I, they've got an immediate need, Okay? Don't you care that we're perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And, what, uh, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? A couple of points here. So. So Jesus awakes, and what does he say? Peace. Peace. Be still. Okay? The wind dies down. The waves die down. And he turns to the disciples, and he asks them a question. What does he ask? Them? You're experienced fishermen. Right? You, you know what to do. Why, why are you so afraid? Why are you still struggling with all of this? You, you got this. But then he asked them another question. He says, what? <clears throat> Have you still no faith? And in the Greek, the, the translation would almost be better rendered as... Um, have you not yet faith? So what's the difference between those? Have you no faith and have you not yet faith? Okay, so you've been with me, guys. You've seen what I'm doing. You're along for the teaching you're along for the journey right have you not yet faith has this not created in you some sort of belief of trust of hope in me right have you no faith would indicate what was that yeah they don't have any have you not yet faith it's still coming Right? It, it's, it's kind of work. It, maybe the seed's planted in them, but it's not yet sprouted, right? Jesus is watering it. And, and it's not quite ready to, to break out of that seed and grow, okay? Have you not yet faith versus have you no faith? Um, kind of an interesting point, okay? Um, and while they were filled with great fear, they said to one another, So once again, we end up with this question, right? And we've seen it multiple times throughout the gospel, right? Um, we see uh, the scribes and the Pharisees pressuring the family, right? Uh, he's out of his mind. They don't believe him. Uh, we see in ver chapter 3, um, they say... He's got an unclean spirit uh, in chapter 2, right? Uh, Jesus heals the paralytic. Uh, we've never seen anything like this. Um, so so what, what are they failing at here? Mm-hmm. 
and we'll get to that in just a second. So they see him as, uh, I, I didn't catch the first part of what you said. Oh, Oral Roberts. No, I, okay. I know who Oral Roberts is. I know who Oral Roberts is. Uh, great preacher, uh, teacher, right? Um, yeah, so they see him kind of as this, this healer, but they, they just aren't putting together what? that he is, right, because what was Mark's statement all the way back at the beginning of the gospel? What did he say? What was his claim about who Jesus was? Go back, take a look at Mark chapter one, right? Look at verse one, and we've talked about this in the past. What was the claim? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God. And so Mark is spending his time showing, right, trying to help people see that this is who Jesus is, that he is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh come among people. And so what are they, they're failing to what? To see it, to understand it, to believe it. They just don't put it all together, right? Great teacher, Miracle worker, but we stop there. We don't go any further, right? They, they just aren't putting it all together of who he really is. Yes? Um, well, really, there's, there, throughout the Gospels, there's not a ton of the disciples went and prayed, right? It's just not there. Um, there's a couple of times, like I think of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked the disciples to go and to pray, and they all fall asleep, right? And Jesus comes back and he says, you know, you can't even stay awake for an hour, right? Um, so, I mean, there, there probably was some prayer there, but it's just not recorded. Um, I'm sure part of, that would be part of, he's a good rabbi, he's a good teacher, so what do you do as a rabbi and teacher? You teach, I mean, what's the job of a pastor, right? I teach you the scripture, I should teach you how to pray, right? Um, but it's, it's not recorded as, as integral, right? Right, the, the other classic example that comes right away into my head because it's a very similar situation is the story of Jonah, right? The boat's being swamped, they're in this great storm. Uh, all of the, the pagans that are on this ship, what do they do? They start praying to whoever their God is. Jonah's down in the belly of the ship sleeping, right? And the captain goes to him and goes, hey, we're gonna die, get up and pray to whatever God you have and maybe they'll save us because none of us are working here. Uh, what we're doing is not, not cutting it. So Jonah gets up and he prays and he says, yeah, I know why this is happening, right? And, and he says, it's my fault, I'm running from God. Um, and what it, eventually it comes to, if you want the storm to, to cut it out, uh, throw me overboard, right? Uh, and what do they do? They eventually, they take him and they chuck him overboard, okay? And uh, all of these pagans realize who the real God is, right? Um, so it's a little bit of a different setting, but it's interesting, Jonah prays, the disciples don't. Good point. Yeah, I, I'm sure they were, right? Uh, immediate need. Right, and, and I think that's, that's something too that oftentimes we're guilty of, aren't we? Right, when we're in an immediate need, our first instinct, our first effort is what? Well, 
oftentimes it's solved the problem, right? I'm missing my keys, I search the house over and over and over again and I can't find my keys. I don't know where they are, right? And it's, you know, how often do we stop and go, okay, I just, I need to pray about this, right? Um, I was just talking to someone, they, they left their cell phone, they were in need of it, couldn't find it, they were scattering all over the place, uh, prayed about it and they said, oh, maybe I should use my landline to call my cell phone and like, she called it and it was sitting in front of her. Like, but you're blind to it, right? You're in such a hurry and in such a, an emotional situation sometimes that that's not our first instinct. Our first instinct is to try to do everything we can by ourselves to fix it. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure they were busy bailing out the ship or the boat that they were in, trying to just do the best we can and finally they realize this ain't working anymore. Let's go get Jesus, let's see what he does. If anything else, he's an extra two hands, we'll get him a bucket, right? Okay, um, let's take a look. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna come back to this real quick. Uh, and they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So they lack this understanding of God but if they knew the Old Testament, let's go to Job. I wanna to go to Job chapter 38. It's right before Psalms. Job chapter 38. Somebody tell me about Job. What do we know about Job? Lost everything. Okay, lots of property, family, lots of material goods. It's all taken from him. Even his health is taken from him. Okay, what else do we know? Yes. Okay, he's a great follower of God. What else? Yeah. I, that's always an interesting point, right? Uh, he's got a couple of friends who come to him to minister to him, and I like to say they start out as the best friends in the world, and they end up being the worst friends possible, right? They come with the best of intentions, they sit with him, they mourn with him, they're really good, and then they open their mouths, and everything falls apart, right? What did you do that brought this all upon you? Just curse God and, and be done with it. Why, why don't you just die? You know, they start doing all this other stuff. It's like, just, just be quiet, right? That's when you were being a good friend. Um, I think there's a lesson in that. But anyways, so Job chapter 38, we're getting to the end of the book of Job. And Job has been faithful all this time. But earlier in chapter, uh, I believe it's 36, Nope, I'm wrong. Uh, it's the end of chapter 37. Um, Job starts to lament his situation, right? Uh, Job is, is frustrated and angry, and he's, um, he says, uh, basically, God, uh, what's the deal, right? Where are you? Why is all this stuff happening to me? Um, and not that he's cursing God, but he's, He's frustrated, right? He's upset, he's angry. I, if you lost everything, I imagine you might have some questions for God about what are you doing here? Like, why is this happening, okay? And God starts to respond to Job in chapter 38. And I wanna point this out. Um, so let's just start at verse one because I wanna, I wanna, I wanna show you something here. Um, Verse one, uh, verse one, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this that dark, darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man, I will question you, and you make it known to me. So what's God doing? Yeah, Job has come with some angry questions for God, and God says, ah, you, you think you're so smart. Let me ask you a few things, right? 
let me, let me see how big your understanding is of how everything works. You wanna ask me, I'm gonna turn it back on you. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have an understanding. Who determined its measures? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So what's God asking you? Were you at the, there at creation? Do you have an understanding of even how the world functions and works and how it was designed, right? Job, you're, you, you seem to be so intelligent, right? And he, he's kind of being sarcastic. God's kind of being sarcastic here with him, right? The obvious answer to all these questions is, no, I don't understand this, right? Uh, Job doesn't know. He wasn't there when the earth was made. He doesn't understand the cornerstone, the foundation, the lines that God's talking about. He has no understanding, right? He goes on, verse 8, and this is the point that the disciples missed, right? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb, when I made clouds its garment and thick, thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you shall come, and no farther, and here shall your proud waves be stayed. So here again, what is God saying? Now remember, he's talking to Job, so let's, let's keep it in context here for a moment. What's, what's his point to Job? Who's in control of what seems to be un uncontrollable? God is, right, yeah. God has power over what seems to be uncontrollable, right? Uh, if, you've, if you've seen flooding, right, uh, when water starts to rise, um, we can divert it sometimes, uh, but how good are we at that? Not very, right? Uh, go talk to the people in Florida, um, right? Or talk to the people in New Orleans when the hurricane hit, right? Um, we can, we can take some steps to try to batten down the hatches, if you will, but when the sea comes, it's coming. And there ain't nothing anybody can do about it, right? But what's his point? Now, now let's apply this to, so that's his point to Job, right? I have power over what seems to be uncontrollable, this great force of nature that you don't even understand. I've got control over it. So let's now apply that to the disciples as they're in the boat with Jesus. Who's in control? Who is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? Well, if there's only one person that the forces of nature listen to, and that would be God, right? But they miss it. They, they don't understand. They don't put it all together. Um, good. God is in control of the wind and the sea. But they just miss it. And, and we see this time and time again in the Gospel of Mark. And we'll see it coming up here. Uh, let's move into chapter 5 because I think this helps to, to solidify the point I'm trying to make. Chapter 5, okay, the wind and the seas obey him, the, they calm down, everything's good. They go to the other, they came to the other side of the sea to the country of the Gerasenes, okay? So now they, uh, if you remember the Sea of Galilee, it's not very big, it's about seven miles from one side to the other, it's a small lake, and they go across. The land of the Gerasenes, there was a city called Gennesaret there, that's where it gets its name, okay? Um, the 10 cities typically thought of as Gentile cities are there. There were Jews who were also living in that region, and that's important because I'll bring that up a little later here, okay? So they get to the, uh, the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs, uh, and on the morning, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stone. 
And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. All right, so let's talk about this for a little bit. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, who's this guy? What do we know about him? Okay, he's got an unclean spirit. He lives among the dead, right? Uh, who are the dead? What, what happens if you're a Jew and you touch somebody who's dead? You're unclean. You're ceremonial unclean. Can't go to the temple, right? You gotta, you gotta wash yourself. You gotta go through the rituals in order to become clean again, okay? What else? Okay, so... He's not socially acceptable, right? People have tried to, I'm gonna say, try to tame him, if you will, right? Try to bring him under control, and every attempt that they've made has failed, right? They, they wrap him up with chains, he breaks the chains, he busts the shackles, right? What else? So he's got incredible strength. What else do we know? Okay, he tortures himself. He's cutting himself with stone, right? He's, he's, yeah, he's cutting himself, good. What else? Yes. Okay, he runs to Jesus when he gets there. We'll come back to that. Somebody else said something. Somebody else had a hand. Yes. He's probably a Gentile, okay? Probably a Gentile. Okay, good. Uh, let's go back to verse six. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Now, so who, who's doing the talking here? Who's controlling this man? Yeah, these demons, right? So now notice, what does that mean? The demons come running to Jesus. They're in control of this man. They're the one who are voicing this. The demons flock to Jesus and they say, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right? So these demons have taken possession of this man and they say, don't torment us, right? Don't, don't, don't send us into the abyss. We don't wanna go there, right? Uh, we don't wanna be there. And we'll come back to that because there's more to it. But they're the ones who fall down before Jesus. Now notice, what is that language of fall down? What do we typically associate that? with, excuse me. Uh, yeah, 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 when, when, did you, when do you get down, right? We, we, get to, we pray, we kneel at the altar, right? You fall down, you prostrate yourself, right? In the Old Testament, they would lay down some, some very traditional, um, maybe you've been to a Catholic church, uh, a very traditional Catholic church, or maybe you've been to a even a very traditional Lutheran church. Uh, sometimes you'll see it when they do consecration. Uh, the pastor will actually lay on the floor, right? Um, not my practice, um, but it, it does happen, right? Um, so this worshiping, but it's not worshiping in the sense of, oh, how great is God? It's please don't hurt us. We don't wanna go there. We don't wanna go back to the abyss. We don't wanna deal with this, right? It's, it's Jesus, don't torment us, okay? And he, sa he was saying to them, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. Verse nine, Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And they begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country, okay? Uh, how many of you know anything about Roman history. How many people, how many soldiers were in a legion? 
6,000, right? I'm not saying that this man was possessed by 6,000 demons. We don't know that. But he's possessed by a whole ton, right? This isn't just one evil spirit doing work. There's a whole bunch here um, that have taken control of this man, okay? My name is Legion, for we are many. They begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country, right? Um, that's an interesting statement. Well, why wouldn't they want to leave the country? I mean, obviously, they don't want to go to hell. That's, that's not a great place. So, but why not leave the country? Okay. Okay. They find more sinners there. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, is they can't, right? They, they can't really bargain with Jesus, but they're kind of trying, right? Uh, we don't, we don't want to go back to hell. That's an awful place. Just don't kick us out of the country. We'll leave this guy alone, but but let us go have rain somewhere, somewhere else here, right? This is a popular place. Uh, the land of the Gerasenes, uh, Canaanite worship, we talk about fertility worship, we talk about um, pagan gods, okay? They're worshiping evil and spirits. They're worshiping uh, fertility gods. Um, and we've talked about that in the past. Uh, you see phallic symbols all over the place in these places, okay? Um, and they say, this, this land is really ripe for us. We don't want to go anywhere else. Let us, we'll leave this guy alone, but let us stay here, okay? Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea, and were drowned in the sea. Okay, what are pigs? Biblical times, what are pigs to Jewish people? They're unclean. Okay, this is where, this is where things get interesting. Um, I was reading a, a commentator on this section, okay, uh, a man by the name of Lenski, and he points out while, while this is Gentile country, Jews were not... It's not that Jews didn't live there at all, right? There, there were Jews who still lived in the area. There were probably still um, Jewish culture in some facet, right? Um, and so he talks about pigs being unclean, and he says, if you were a Jew who was raising pigs, uh, this is the prime spot, right? The Gentiles don't care. Uh, there's few and fewer Jews living in this area there's nobody who really rat on you for what you're doing, right? And you're making a living, right? Gentiles eat pigs, so if that's what I can do, that's what I'm gonna do. I can feed my family. I raise pigs, I sell them to the Gentiles, they eat them, great, no big deal, okay? Um, but they're considered unclean animals. And so they enter these pigs, and what happens? Yeah, they go running off the cliff and they drown in the sea, okay? Now notice, <coughs> verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and the country. And the people came to see what, what had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs? And they began, uh, they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Now, here's, here's the interesting thing. Chances are the owner of the pigs is not there, right? He's got hired hands to do the, his work, right? To watch my flocks. They see what happens, and, and what do they do? Before that. They run into town, right? They're probably looking for the owner of the flock going, uh, we just lost your flock. We're in big trouble. We got to figure something out here, right? Let's go tell him what happened. And guess what? We know who's to blame for all of this, right? Because when they come back to the fields, what do they do? 
they give report. Who are they reporting to? The owner, probably those who were with the owner at the time, right? Uh, everybody's gonna flock out to hear what happened, right? 2,000 pigs ran down a cliff. Somebody's, somebody's income was just completely wiped out, okay? So they all come out and they start saying, and what do they tell them about? What, what, do they get, what do they say as they give report? They talk about what? What happened to the pigs, but also what happened to the man? Now remember, what did we describe this man as? He was possessed, he had evil spirits, incredible strength, Nobody could bind him, nobody could help him, nobody could do anything for him, right? Every time they tried, he'd break bonds, he'd break chains, he'd cut himself, he's screaming day and night, he's living among the dead, and they come and they start giving report, and here's Jesus standing here, and here's a guy who had once been completely out of control, and what, where, what is he? He's... He's calm, he's sitting, he's dressed. Complete change, complete change in the man. And they see it, but what's their concern? <laughs> so they were, they seen it described to them what happened to the demon possessed man and to the pigs and they began Jesus to, de to beg Jesus to depart from their region, right? They're more concerned about the income. Somebody's source of livelihood was just destroyed. We don't want you here because if you do this again, somebody else is gonna lose their income, right? Somebody else's livelihood is gonna be robbed from them. You're a threat to us, get out of here. They have no care for the demon-possessed man at all. This guy they all knew, this guy that they probably had some sort of interaction with, right? So once again, we come back to what is Jesus' emphasis or what is he showing to people that he, he cares? He cares more about people than the law. He cares more about people than animals, livelihood, right? He cares about people, their eternal well-being, right? In this case, specifically this case, right? If you're demon-possessed and you die, chances are what's gonna happen? They're going to hell, right? But Jesus sends the demons away. This man is calm, he's in his right mind. He cares for him. As they were getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might go with them. And he did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your, uh, to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Now this is fascinating too. So typically when Jesus has done a healing, what does he do? When Jesus does a healing, what does, he, what does he typically tell the person? Zip it, right? Go do what the law prescribes. Go to the temple, offer sacrifice, keep your mouth closed, right? It's not my hour, it's not my time. Be quiet. And they all go and they open their mouths and they blab and Jesus gets driven out of every city he's in, right? Because all the people are flocking to him and he's causing a stir and a ruckus. This time, Jesus tells this Gentile man, this man who was living among tombs, who was possessed by demons, and he says to him what? Go tell everyone. Why? So he wants people to know that he's not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles. I think that's a very important point that Jesus is setting himself up already as not just being for the Jewish people, but he is Lord of all 
everyone, of the nations, right? Um, the Messiah loves the world, right? In contrast to what the Jewish people believed about the Messiah, which was what? That he came to save the Jews, to build up Israel, to make them the once great nation, uh, an even better nation than they were under King David, right? When everybody was unified and together and, and we were all living in happiness and harmony, right? Well, it's kind of. But things were good. Things were generally good on a national level when King David was there. They thought that that's what the purpose was, that Jesus was gonna come, kick out the Romans, or that the, excuse me, that the Messiah would come, kick out the Romans, that Israel would be, they would all come together under one king again, that they would be this great nation and ruling power, and Jesus is saying, no, that's not the way this works. You go tell all your friends, tell all your family, tell everyone you know how much the Lord, now notice he calls himself what? The Lord, how much the Lord has done for you, okay? And what happens? They hear it. And what? What's the last word of this section? They marveled. They marveled. There's this sense of good news, the sense of hope, a sense of, uh, maybe we can even dare to say, faith in what Jesus has done. This man who everybody knows was demon-possessed, uncontrollable, is now telling us that somebody came and healed him. And we see the evidence right in front of us. Maybe even a little bit of faith in who this guy is telling them about, this Jesus person. You see the contrast that I'm drawing here? Right? The Jewish people who should know about the Messiah don't. The disciples are with Jesus they see all that he does. They don't get it. Jesus heals a man. He goes and he tells everybody that he's been healed by Jesus. And what happens? They maybe even dare to say, believe in what has happened and who this guy is. Isn't that fascinating? All right, let's move on. Uh, verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, so now he, a day has kind of passed here, okay, and they go back to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet. Notice, same language as we had with the demon-possessed man. And he implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. And he went with him. Okay, so he's a leader of the synagogue. What does that mean? Yeah. He's, he's a very important person. We, we might call him like head elder, right? He's, he's a ruler of a local church. He's the council president. He's, I, I don't know how else you would describe it, right? He, he's a lay guy. He's not a priest. <coughs> but he's kind of the guy who, who makes sure that everything is working, right? That they have, that the, the synagogue has everything they need to conduct services, that they're, they're kind of monitoring all the other stuff, and then the priest does the service, Okay. Um, and he pray, he comes to Jesus and he falls down before him. Why? Because he's, what, what's happening in his life? Yeah, his daughter's dying, right? Uh, his daughter is dying. Um, come and lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. Now notice what he asks Jesus to do. Come and Put your hands on her. Touch her, right? Now, we've seen before with some other miracles, how has Jesus done miracles? He's done it by touch, but he's also done it by word, right? Your faith has made you well. Get up, walk. Think of the paralytic, right? 
Jairus says, hey, come touch her. And there again, we have a, a unique wording situation here uh, so that she may be made well. Uh, really, the word in Greek is the word saved, so that she may be saved and live. So notice what he's asking of Jesus. Save my daughter. Save her from what? I think the obvious is, okay, dying, right? But what else? We gotta, we gotta expand that out because I think it's bigger than just the immediate. Ah, eternal death, right? I think there's this element of everlasting, that she would be saved eternally. He's recognizing something about Jesus. Here's this man of great power. I know he can heal her, but this word that he uses has this connotation of, of like, not just the immediate save, but long term, right? Um, salvation, okay? That you may bring her salvation, and she would live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him uh, in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garment, I will be made well. Okay, I want to pause there. So, here's this woman with a discharge of blood uh, for 12 years. Uh, if you're bleeding in Jewish law culture, what does that mean? Unclean. Chances are this is, you know, we don't know for sure, but chances are, or it's believed, that this is a, a menstrual flow that has been going on for 12 years straight. So she's unclean. So you can't be in crowds, you can't be with other people, right? Um, but she hears this report of Jesus, okay, from others. Let me back up one second here. So what does it say she did? She's got this issue, so what does she do? She goes to all these different doctors, and she's seen by all these many physicians. And, and why do you go to a doctor if you're sick? Well, we, we want to get better, we want to be healed, but we go to them because we what? We, we trust them. We believe that they can do that, right? We believe that they can actually give us some hope and, and make us better. That's why you go to a doctor. You don't go to a doctor going, hey, I'm just going to go throw 3,000 bucks at an issue and they're never going to fix it, but I'm going to go anyways, right? I mean, you might as well just take your wallet and light it on fire, right? If you have no hope, what's the point, right? No, she hoped, she believed, she trusted that these doctors would be able to fix her issue. And in fact, it says that she did what? She, she spent everything. She's got nothing left, okay? She spent every dollar she's had trying to fix this problem. And in fact, not only were they not able to make her well, but it got worse, okay? 12 years this has been happening. And she hears this report about Jesus. And so she sneaks up in the crowd, if you will, behind him and touched his garment. Now notice, this statement is almost a, a, a the statement comes after, but really, I, I imagine that this thought that we get to look into her mind and read is actually prior to her action, right? Because what is she believing? Even if I just touch his clothes, right? Even if I just touch his cloak, uh, I'll be made well, right? So there again, what does she have? She's got faith that Jesus can heal her, that Jesus has some sort of power over what she's experiencing and what she's going through, that Jesus can do something about this and so because she believes this, I, you almost want to flip those two verses, right? Uh, because she believes this, she sneaks up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. 
and immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out of him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing around you and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. Now, here again, great miracle worker, great teacher, everybody's flocking to Jesus. Jesus is back in Jewish country, and what happens? Everybody hears it, and so what do they do? They come running to Jesus, right? They all come flocking to Jesus. What's he gonna do next? What's gonna happen? What's he gonna say, right? We wanna see, we wanna hear, we wanna be there, right? And they're all pushing in around him. And, and I, think of, I think of almost being at like a, <coughs> excuse me, I think of almost being at like, like a rock concert, right? You're just jammed in there and you're, there's 900 people around you. Who's touching you? I, I don't really know, right? But this lady comes through the crowd and she just touches the, the fringe of his garment, right? And, and what they used to wear was, um, Jewish people wore a, uh, a diamond-shaped uh, shawl. And so it, it came down like this, and it had tassels on it, and it came down in the back, right? And it's this diamond-shaped shawl. And he she touches his garment, and Jesus says, what? Who touched me? And the disciples look at Jesus and they go, what do you mean who touched you? Everybody's touching you, Jesus, right? How can you ask this question? It seems, it seems silly, stupid, right? Everybody's touching you. But Jesus says, no, 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 power has gone out of me. Somebody has touched me. And he looks around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. Now I gotta bend down here and try to read my note. Okay, so why would she come in fear and trembling? Why would she come with fear and trembling? Okay, she didn't ask for permission. She's a woman. Okay, he, Jesus knows that something has happened to him. She's unclean. Yeah, all these things play into this situation. She's a woman. She's unclean. She's in a crowd when she's not supposed to be, right? She's touching other people as she's in this crowd, which would render all of them unclean as well, which means they can't go to temple, right? There's, there's a big issue here. And so she comes out of fear because I've touched someone uh, and I've been healed of my illness and while that's a great thing, wh what might happen if people knew this? What might happen to her if people knew that she had this flow of blood, that she's unclean, she's out in the streets, she's touching people, what might happen? They might stone her for what she's done. And so she comes with fear and trembling and she falls down before him and she tells him the whole truth, right? And, and now imagine being a woman and have to explain this whole situation in and amongst a crowd, right? This is shame, there's pain, there's agony, there's hopelessness in the situation. Like now I'm, now I'm hopeful, but I still don't know what the outcome is. I may be healed, but I may be put to death, right? I, what's gonna happen, right? She comes in great fear and trembling. She tells him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter. Oh, that's interesting. Calls her family, daughter. Your faith has made you well, go in peace and be healed of your disease. So, yeah. Um, 
so, okay, you could flip the coin over and ask, did she know that Jesus is God? What ha she recognizes what happens to her, that suddenly this flow of blood stops. Could, there could be some of that in there. I, she does it in faith, you're right, right? Because she, she hears the reports and she goes, right? Knowing she's unclean, she fights through the crowds. I, maybe it's a little bit of both, now that you say that, now that I think about it. I, I'm, still, I'm still pondering with the fact that she goes before she's been set free of the shame, right? She's, she goes and approaches Jesus and explains her situation, still not knowing the reaction of everybody around her when she has to fess up to what happened, right? So there might be a little awe that Jesus has been able to stop this when everybody else hasn't, but I'm still not out of the woods yet, right? I still got this issue of, of breaking the law, and I'm living in Jewish country. This is important, right? I've made everyone unclean around me. Um, if you go back to, I believe it's Numbers, um, Levitical law said that if a woman was on her menstrual cycle, she could not enter the, the, the temple, okay? Or that she couldn't, she couldn't come to God, okay? Um, and so it said that she was, a, a woman on her menstrual cycle was unclean, that they had to go through a purification ritual after the flow of blood had been stopped to be made clean again so that they could resume being in the community of faith, right? So it's almost like this temporary hold that happens every month, right? They're like you're in, oh, pause, stop, exile for a couple of days, right? Even a man who touched his wife who was on her menstrual cycle would be made unclean, right? So, so she's completely isolated from everyone, okay? And then once that purification ritual has happened, she's declared clean again by a priest, then she's brought back in the community. So there's this constant state of, of limbo if you're a woman. What? You lived in a, in a very male-dominated world, right? That's... What? Um, so it's included in the, so we always, we think of God giving the law, the Ten Commandments on the Mount, right? Uh, but God gives uh, more than just the Ten Commandments. This is one of them, right? So this isn't made up by the priests, right? This was one of the laws that God gave to Moses that um, this was the way society worked, okay? Yes? Yeah, there's probably a little bit of both, right? She hears the report. I've not been able to be made well, fixed by anybody. Um, maybe this guy can do something. I'm hearing that he's a great miracle worker. I'm sure there's a sense of desperation because if she doesn't and this flow of blood doesn't stop, what does it mean? Okay, she's out of options. She may bleed to death. She's exiled from the world, right? She, no husband, no family, can't be around other people, lacking of community, right? All of those things are happening because she's had this constant state for 12 years. So I'm sure there's some desperation in there of, I just, anybody ever been through a period where you're just not around other people? At some point, you just want to be around others. We all have that inclination to be with other people. I mean, 
I'm extroverted, but I'm also, I have introverted tendencies at times, right? And, and when I lean too far this way and I'm by myself for too long, like there's this need, this desire that arises within me of I, I have to get back over here. I have to just be with other people, right? I don't care what we're doing. I just need to be around somebody else, right? That happens. And I'm sure that's probably what she's going through, okay? Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. No blame, no shame, no, hey, there's consequences for what you've done. No, hey, you don't need to go and prove yourself to the rabbi. None of that. Jesus says, go in peace and be healed of your disease. He confirms what has happened to her. He confirms the miracle that has just occurred. He doesn't give the crowds a chance to speak. He doesn't give anybody a chance to rebut what has happened or argue with what's happened or say, hey, but wait a minute, she was unclean and she was touching all of us. No, Jesus says, peace, your faith has made you well, go. That's it, end of story, okay? So, let's, I wanna finish this up. I know we're over time, I'm sorry. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house uh, some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Okay, uh, so Jesus has been slowed down. He's going with Jairus, and all of a sudden the crowds start pressing in around him. Uh, he has this interaction with the woman, okay? And, and what happens in the meantime? Yeah, the little, the, uh, Jairus' fears, his greatest worry has now been confirmed. Right, People from his house come say, she's dead, and, and notice what they ask or what they say at the end. They say what? Why trouble the teacher any further? What are they implying? She's dead. He can't do anything. He can't make her well. He can't fix her, she's dead. Remember, and we, I know I've heard this in a sermon here, I think it was Pastor Tom who talked about this, Jews believe that when you are dead, you are dead, and that's it, right? Dead, dead is dead, that's the end, done, finite, over, right? Why trouble the teacher any further? He can't do anything, he can't fix this. But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe, right? And, and here again, we have, this, we have this mistranslation, if you will, or this maybe a better, a more closely, uh, uh, more, um, a better way of saying this in the Greek or how it would come across in the Greek is do not give in to your fear, right? Do not buy into what you have just been told. Do not give in to that fear and that hopelessness that your daughter has died. That's what Jesus is saying. Do not fear. Do not give in to that fear. Just believe. That's a pretty big ask in that moment. Your daughter has died. Just believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James, Okay, so he breaks off from the rest of the disciples. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Um, if you know anything about Jewish culture, uh, when you died, this was customary. This large uh, band of people wailing and crying and screaming, and they'd blow trumpets and horns and different things, right? It wasn't necessarily a celebration, but it was a, a way to alert people that this has happened, okay? Um, a lot of the times, these were, there were professional weepers and wailers. Talk about a career, right? Uh, you go from somebody who's died over here to somebody who's died over here, and you just yell and scream and cry, uh, and, and that's your job, okay? And Jesus... Jesus calls them out for this commotion. He says, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child's not dead, but sleeping, right? Um, 
and here again, you've you got to weigh this with what's been said before, right? The message that Jairus received was what? She's dead. Jesus comes onto the scene, okay? He told Jairus, don't give in to that fear. Don't believe what you're hearing. Just believe. He sends away the weepers and the wailers and the people who are making this great big commotion. And what does he say? She's not dead, but sleeping. Now, well, we may think of Jewish culture, point, was pointed out, there were doctors. They know what dead is, right? They know what dead is. They, they have an understanding of somebody's not breathing anymore. Life is gone. They get that, okay? So let's not, let's not get it in our minds that she's just sleeping. No, no, she's eternally sleeping here, okay? Um, Long-term sleep. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with them and went in where the child was, okay? Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talithia kumi, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement, and he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Okay. Jesus dismisses everybody. He takes father, mother, his three disciples. He goes in, okay, and notice what he does. What does he do when he gets into the room? I, he... He touches her. Now, once again, what did Jewish law say? You don't touch a dead person. You are unclean if you touch a dead person. Jesus just touched a woman who had a flow of blood, which would have made him unclean. He now touches a dead body, which would have made him unclean, right? Here again, what are we finding out about Jesus? Jesus doesn't care about the law. Jesus cares about People. Jesus loves people, and he's showing mercy, and he's bringing God's love into people's lives. He does not care what the law prescribes, but he does care about grace and mercy. He takes her by the hand and says to her, get up, I, a little girl, I say to you, arise. Mark's favorite word shows up. What happens? Immediately, she gets up, and she begins walking, and they were overcome, immediately, they were overcome with amazement. Here again, we have this, this kind of tricky wording in the Greek, okay? If I were to give you a wooden translation, what the Greek says word for word, without kind of trying to put it in great English, okay? It, it would mean, and they were, they were asking, or they were questioning, who is this, right? There's this awe there of what they've just seen. Dead is dead. We know what death looks like. And suddenly this girl who was once dead is now up and moving and walking. And what does Jesus say? Don't tell anyone, but what? Give her something to eat. Now that's interesting. Why would he say, give her something to eat? Dead people don't eat. Dead people don't need nourishment. Dead people don't take in sustenance, right? This isn't a figment of your imagination. She's been healed, and to prove that she's been healed, go give her some food. Feed her. She's just been through something. And she's alive and she's well. Feed her. Take care of her. Life has resumed where there was no life. Right? And once again, by saying, 
give her something to eat, Jesus is proving that he cares, that he heals. If we go back to the beginning of Mark, Jesus is proving, what was Mark's claim? That he is the son of God in the flesh. Come among them, right? I, I come back to, my, to the earlier thought that we talked about Jewish law, if everybody would just keep the Sabbath for two Sabbaths, the Messiah would come. And Jesus is not only breaking the Sabbath, he's touching the unclean, he's hanging out with demons, he's casting, you know, he's casting out demons, I shouldn't say hanging out with demons, right? But the demons recognize him but the Jewish people, the people who know the Old Testament or should know the Old Testament, they don't get it. They don't understand who he really is. Any questions? All right, let's pray. Thank you for sticking with me. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, uh, your word is amazing. Uh, re you reveal to us your love for us, and, and we see that in Jesus, your great care for your creation, your power, and your authority over your creation. But we just, we see and we marvel at your love for your people. Uh, we have been created in your image. You love us, you care for us, you provide for us, and we see that in Jesus as he cares for the sick and the hurting and the downtrodden and those who were outcast. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for your love. We thank you for what Jesus has done. Um, and we thank you most of all uh, for the sacrifice that he has made to redeem us, people who, are, uh, people who are impacted by sin and burdened by sin, who are outcast because of the, the things we do, the failure to meet your law, and who are dead in our trespasses. But yet you came among us to give your life, your son came among us to give his life, so that we might receive the gift, the promise of eternal life, and that we might live forever with you. Keep us trusting in that good news all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you everyone.